just the anatomy of the eye and some of the diagnostics that you may have seen done on, on your pets, and then go into some of the more common problems that are more specific to the Samoyed. Anybody by any chance have a pointer? Because I, mine, the battery went dead. <laughs> so, at any rate, I'll go up here. Um, Can we turn the lights off? So, this is a cross section of the eye. And the surface of the eye is the cornea. Then there's a space filled with fluid called the anterior chamber. The pigmented part of the eye is the iris, and the hole in the iris is the pupil. And then the lens is behind the iris. This area right here is a gel-like substance called the vitreous, and the part of the eye responsible for vision is this yellow band right here, the retina. And all the information from the retina is sent to the brain by the optic nerve. So the fluid that fills the eye, that fills the anterior chamber, is produced here by the ciliary body. And it flows through the pupil, fills the anterior chamber, and gets out of the eye at the same rate at which it's produced through this angle. And being a cross-section, it makes it look like this area is above and below the lens, but it goes 360 degrees around. And that's going to be important when I talk about glaucoma. So now if we look at the parts of the eye up front, when we talk about the inner and outer aspects of the eye, it's referred to as the medial is the inner and the lateral is the outer. And of course, um, all of you know, but it's amazing how many people do not know, that dogs and cats have three eyelids, the upper, the lower, and the third eyelid. And the third eyelid comes up over the eye very quickly whenever a dog blinks and it acts like a windshield wiper. And at the base of the third eyelid is a gland that produces about 50% of the tear production. There are a number of breeds that um, have this gland get swollen and pop out of the position and it, it's called cherry eye because it looks like there's a little cherry out of the eye. So the white of the eye is the sclera and then the entire eye is basically lined by conjunctiva which um, usually should be a light pink in color but if it's inflamed gets can get up to a pretty nasty shade of red. So this little guy um, is having his tear production checked. This is what's known as a Shermer tear test. Shermer strips are special strips of uh, paper, litmus paper, and we know what where the marking should be for a normal dog. Um, Normal tear production for a dog is about 15 millimeters of wetting in 60 seconds. <coughs> in order to look at the upper eyelid, you can, um, I'm sorry, look at the third eyelid, you can press on the upper lid, and the third eyelid should come up across. Um, I frequently ask boxer breeder, I shouldn't say boxer breeders, boxer judges, whether they check for third eyelids because it's unfortunately a habit of some of the box of breeders. They think that the third eyelid is ugly, especially if it's not pigmented. And when they have the dog under anesthesia, maybe, um, to do the ears, they remove the third eyelid. Oh. So, yeah, it is. And it's obviously cosmetic surgery, but, you know, the judges don't look for it. Does an AKC call them on that? That's all there is. If they don't identify it, you know, I was one. I was once having lunch with judges at a at a dog show, 
that I was doing an eye clinic, and, and one of the judges said after lunch he was judging the boxers, and I asked him about it, and he looked at me like he didn't know what I was talking about. That sounds about right. <laughs> So, this, I guess there's a love-hate relationship with the AKC. Um, so, this is a uh, fluorescein um, stain. When the cornea is healthy and intact, it will not take up any of the stain. When there's a break in the surface of the cornea, then it will take up the fluorescein stain. And it will, with a cobalt light or a blue light, it will shine green. Um, I think a number of you have brought your dogs to me because of some excess drainage, and frequently this drainage is because there is a um, block in the nasal lacrimal duct. There are two openings to the duct which are called puncta, and they're just inside the upper and the lower lids. And so this basically shows um, a little cur a blunt curved needle, it's not sharp, uh, called a cannula that has been slipped into the upper punctum. And then usually you can flush and fluid will come out of the lower punctum. And then if you just put some pressure on the lower lid, you force the fluid to come out through the nose. Is this the stain that you see oftentimes? Yes. Like all the time? And, you mm -hmm. can't, and this is just a close-up of the cannula inside the punctum. Okay. So, oh, a little dirty, but whatever. Um, dirt is on the slide, it's not on the retina. So this is the uh, um, picture of a dog's retina. This is a normal <coughs> retina. And whenever I go into um, discussions of some of the inherited problems, I'm going to refer back to a normal retina. So when you have a normal retina, it's arbitrarily divided into two parts. The upper part is what's called the tapetum. The lower part is the non-tapetum. The tapetum is a layer of crystalline cells underneath the retina. And what happens is when light comes through the pupil and gets focused by the lens onto the retina, the light goes through and stimulates the photoreceptor cells, and then it bounces back off the tapetum, and it stimulates the photoreceptor cells a second time. So that's why dogs and cats with a tapetum see better than we do at night. There are two types of photoreceptor cells in the retina, the rods and the cones. The rods are responsible for nighttime vision, and the cones are responsible for daylight, more central, and color vision. Dogs' retinas are about 95% rods, which again is why they normally see better than we do at night, and why they have very, very limited color vision. Um, it was thought once upon a time that dogs were totally <coughs> colorblind, but they're not. They're more like somebody who's red-green colorblind. They see blue and they see yellow, but they don't see red and green. So it's kind of strange that they run after red balls all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the optic nerve, a nice, healthy, pink optic nerve, and the vessels, the arteries, and the veins that flow in and out of it. So we have to remember what normal looks like, because now we're going to look at some abnormal. So these are retinal folds. These are retinal folds in the non-tapetum, so that they show up white. They look like little white worms. And these are retinal folds in the tapetum. They show up as dark squiggles instead of white squiggles. So these would be considered multifocal folds. And of course, we all know that Samoyeds get multifocal, focal, and multifocal folds. And until recently, during a breed exam, 
um, if these were identified, it was an automatic no for breeding. But there is a genetic test now available through Optogen that differentiates between retinal folds that hopefully are totally benign versus the retinal folds associated with the oculoskeletal abnormalities or the dwarfing. Excuse me? You're saying there's a genetic difference between the two? Yeah. Okay. So if you have a dog that has folds, but if you have also had the test that shows that the dog is negative for the gene for ocular skeletal dystrophy, then your dog, then the markings on the form will change from a no to a breeder option. So, but, yeah. But uh, can you, will you know this in, in looking at a puppy, or do you have to wait for a certain age or something to well, do this test? Well, the problem, the problem with these guys is that sometimes in young dogs, one or two lone retinal folds, as the dog gets a little bit older, will flatten out and go away. So if a dog is, if you see a dog when it's like, three or four months and older and it has a retinal fold and that retinal fold is there to stay. It's not going to go away. Um, so, but you don't know whether the dog had retinal folds that flattened out or have retinal folds. It's kind of a real murky area there. The, with the gene, um, there are, and it's, and this is in the handout, because, and it's from, I printed it out from Optogen. There are two, when you have the test done, there are three results you can get. Homozygous means that you have two genes, of two of the same gene. You can have normal, where both genes are normal. You can have homozygous abnormal, both genes are abnormal, and you can have a case where you have one normal and one abnormal gene, so which is called heterozygote. So if your dog, if you have the test done, you can, the results will be one of the three. If the dog is normal or a carrier, a heterozygous, then it will be changed to breeder option from a no for breeding. And from that, you can determine how you can or cannot breed the dog. Dogs that have both bad genes are the ones that have retinal folds and they are also dwarfed. Dogs that are heterozygous have retinal folds, but they have normal skeletons. And then, of course, you have normal dogs that are normal. And the reason that this is done is because you can also have retinal folds that have nothing to do with the dwarfing gene. So you have to be able to differentiate. So, um, and it's my understanding that Optogen, I think, will do like group tests and the, the uh, price gets a little bit less expensive if tests are sent in as a group. Um, I always say that male dogs can do a lot more damage than a female, so if you were going to selectively have some of your dogs tested, it should always be the males because they can produce hundreds of puppies, if not thousands of puppies. Female can have just so many puppies in her lifetime, so she's not going to do as much damage to the breed as a male that's you know, a very you know, frequently used stud dog. Is it clear? Because the handout will make it clearer too. Yeah. So the, the dwarf gene and the other gene are not linked. They're, they're totally separate. They're totally different, separate. Different chromosomes. Right. <clears throat> so this is what histologically what retinal folds look like. The retina basically during development just folds over on itself. 
Now, what problem does that cause for the dog itself during its lifetime? Retinal folds, nothing. Nothing. So the eyesight is not affected nothing. or anything like that. It's possible that in those very specific spots, there might be like a little focal blind spot, but we can't do testing like they do for people, you know, raise your paw when you see the red light. Um, so overall, the dog, it doesn't bother the dog at all. So why, why would they not want to breed them then if it doesn't hurt the dogs? Well, because if you breed the dogs that have retinal folds that are associated with the dwarfing, then yeah. you'll end up breeding a lot of... Uh, you see dogs with real short little legs or funny wow. shapes and all that. It affects the, the skeleton of the dog, and so you end up with just like humans, you know, with you have dwarfs with the, the legs are shortened and the you, you have some waves that. that have legs that look like a basset dog. Yeah, people are short, basically. Yeah, basically. Yeah. Well, uh -huh. I'm trying to remember if we did or if it was a different one, but I can probably get pictures of one mm -hmm. that shows that exactly. when you see it, you know it. That's wow. So uh -huh. this this is a this is a dog. It's it, none of these pictures are Samoyeds, but um, you can also have there have has not to date been a gene that's been identified with the types of um, uh, retinal dysgenesis that I'm dysplasia that I'm going to be discussing in the next in the next moment or two but it's just something that you should know about about the reason why you, even when you don't have the dwarfing gene you might want to steer away from breeding two <coughs> dogs that both have retinal folds even though neither one has the OSD gene so in this area right here <coughs> There is an area that is um, has not formed normally, and this would be called a geographic dysplasia, um, and it very frequently shows up as a little circle. And this is also a geographic dysplasia. You can see how it sort of fans out, and it's abnormal development of the uh, retina. This type would be more common in, in um, Springer Spaniels and Labrador Retrievers. And you can get to the point where retinal dysplasia actually causes total retinal detachment. Oh, it's not painful, it just doesn't allow them to see anymore. Okay, so this is probably, for me at least, the worst problem I see in Samoyeds. And it's, um, it has to do, it's, it's a form of void Karamagi Harada syndrome, which is a syndrome identified predominantly in Scandinavian people and also people in Japan. And it's <clears throat> in people, in dogs, it's also known as the uveal um, dermatologic syndrome. So what happens is the body reacts as if pigmented cells are a foreign body. And it sets up inflammation because it sends in all of the troops to destroy these pigmented cells. So frequently you will have a dog that normally has a black nose and black eyelids suddenly start depigmenting. And because you have pigmented cells in the eye, it affects the eye as well. And it sets up very, very severe uveitis, which is a fancy term for intraocular inflammation. And this dog does have VKH. Um, and you can see that, um, you can see a lot of inflammatory debris. Um, some of these vessels are within the iris, which is very swollen, and some of them are on the surface of the eye. And the white of the eye is not at all happy. Um, sometimes this type of uveitis from the inflammation 
can lead to a secondary glaucoma because it causes the angle to close. And that is incredibly painful. How so rare this is excuse me? How rare or common are these Um I see them they're relatively common in Akitas. Um, I certainly have seen a number in, in Samoyas, but not recently, not quite well. Um, they can, they're more common in certain breeds, but um, they can occur in almost any breed. Yeah? I, I apologize um, for uh, the questions that people have probably already asked. And since we walked through late, I'm sure you've covered this. But at what point do you do this testing? Testing for, for this? There isn't any test for VKH. But if you did, if you, if you tested like people test for, um, say, Tay-Sachs disease at the beginning of um, a pregnancy, I mean, we can know how many boys and how many girls the dogs can have. Why couldn't you check their DNA then? There, there isn't any marker for this. There isn't a marker? No. You need to have had um, the, the gene or the marker for that gene identified in order to test for it. And it hasn't been identified, so there's no test for a BKH. It's, there's no test even in people for BKH. So this is what the retina can look like when you have this because there's a lot of pigment in the retina. The non-tapetal area is, um, doesn't, is, has a lot of pigment in it. And then underneath the tapetum is an area called the pigment epithelium. So that the body attacks all these areas and causes inflammation. Um, I had, because the cells um, that, are, that become uh, pigmented cells in the embryo, it's, it's called the nuchal crest. And these cells migrate to different parts of the body and some of them become pigmented cells, um, melanocytes. Some of them form the bones, the inner ear. And I, several years ago, I treated um, a, a Nikita for probably five or six years. We were able to keep him visual, but Ultimately, he lost his vision to glaucoma, but he also lost his hearing. So, so when everything is quieted down, this is what you end up with. You, uh, this is what a retina would look like when things have been calmed down. Um, you can see all the areas of the splotchy pink areas, and those are all what's called chorioretinal lesions. Um, and they're all non-pigmented because all the pigmented cells in that area have been destroyed. Do, do dogs have this problem? Because it's obviously an immune mm -hmm. problem. The immune system is attacking itself. Do they end up with other kinds of medical problems too, attacking other parts of the body? Um, usually not, uh -huh. but yeah. the dogs need to be on long-term um, immunosuppressants, prednisone, imuran, yeah. sometimes systemic cyclosporine, mm -hmm. and ultimately those can cause problems with the liver yeah. and the kidneys. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, so the human, like me, with looking at my dog, is there some way I can detect this in their eyes before it gets so blown out of? Well, if you start seeing depigmentation of the nose or the eyelids or the lip area, then that means that there's something going on. Um, you see a lot of Samoyans with the thinking in the nose. That's so, but it's, that's yeah, but, but that's this is usually an inflammatory uh, type of lesion as opposed to, um, and I'll show you some pictures of a, of a Australian Shepherd that has it in the progression. Um, but if you saw the inside of the eye starting to look inflamed, cloudy, Usually the dogs will be um, photophobic and not going to want to be out in the bright light because that causes discomfort. Um, and if you just see um, redness, cloudiness, discomfort in bright light, then those are all clues that something's wrong. 
Is there a particular age? Is this be any age that this happens? Most of them are older than four. Most of the ones that I've seen at the onset is between four and seven. If you treat it, does it get better and can it be cured? It can't be cured, but it can be controlled. So you start treatment and you start treatment at very high levels of medications. And as it comes under control, you very slowly wean them down to the lowest amount of medication that will control it. With the knowledge that if any flare-up is seen, you just have to go back up with the medications. Is it drops or something else? Well, it, something like Something like that would be treated with oral medications and systemic and topical medications. If it's, an, if it's an inflammatory process, does that mean it, it's, uh, it's not there at birth? Or no, it's it, not there at birth. It's not there at birth? No. Which would... Which it's would an autoimmune problem. Except that, except that retinal, usually retinal issues can relate to diabetic issues. And very diabetes. rarely in the dog. Diabetic retinopathy is very, very rare in the dog because of the difference in in the anatomy of the dog's retina and the difference in the vasculature. I know that every two weeks they come out with a new marker. And of course... <laughs> and he is a nurse. She's a nurse. Yeah, oh, but there's... there's of course, having a mother that they gave a nine-year-old a nine-year treatment to, you know, it has to be popular for them to be looking for, for something. Um, could they come, could it come across accidentally um, while they're looking at other things since they're, they are finding new markers and mutations? Well, I mean, time? you know, a lot of these, the search for the markers have, have to be funded. So, you know, a lot of it has to, which ones they look for have to do with where they're getting the funding. There are different brain groups and so on will often take care That's why, that's why the, uh, most, most of the markers that have been identified have been for retinal degeneration because a lot of the funding comes from NIH. Yeah. And they're interested in, in finding the answers to, uh, because progressive retinal atrophy is the canine version of retinitis pigmentosa. So this is a little Aussie that here he is at um, four months of age and he has absolutely normal pigment. Here he is at a year of age and you can see the depigmentation of the fur around the eyes, the lid margins, and the nose. And here he is at about six years of age. And you can see that the lid margins are depigmented and um, and even and the nose is depigmented. And can he's back lost up one slide, please. Yeah. Of course our dogs are white to begin with yeah. general rules, so yeah. 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 But you're looking yeah, for the I'm depigmentation of the black areas. Oh, yeah. It looks like the squinting of the black. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But it's And this is a close-up of his nose. And here's another dog with VKH. So it's not just a depigmentation, it's like an inflammatory. So these dogs that you're showing us pictures of are obviously being treated and that's the best they get? Not all, some of these pictures, well, the, the, um, the first dog that, I, that was followed, right. that dog is relatively well controlled. This dog, I, probably the picture was taken at presentation. Some of these dogs aren't under. And they can get better than that if oh, yeah. treating it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But the pigment isn't going to come back. Usually not. You just get the information. So the next topic that I wanted to discuss a little bit was cataracts and the lens. So the lens is made up of layers of protein. And these layers of protein are added onto throughout life. 
but the lens can't keep growing because the eye doesn't keep growing. So these layers get compacted together. And so what happens to dogs is exactly what happens to us, that by the time you're 40, 50, you need reading glasses or bifocals. The lens gets hard, and it doesn't change shape to focus. So dogs will have problems um, figuring out exactly how far away from them something is. They frequently will have trouble with stairways going down the stairs. They hesitate until they get their paw on the first step. If you hold a treat out for them, they might nip at the air or bypass and go past the treat and nip your fingers. So the the um, well, that's just Sammy behavior. Really. <laughs> <laughs> so the lens is held in place by a capsule. And the lens itself is in a very liquid environment, the aqueous humor and the vitreous. And there are cells in the capsule that biochemically keep the lens fibers relatively free of fluid compared to all of this fluid that surrounds the lens. A cataract forms when these cells either stop functioning or they're just overwhelmed with the amount of fluid coming in. And so that's what a cataract is. When the fluid gets into the lens fibers, it disrupts their arrangement and light doesn't pass through that particular area. And that's what a cataract is. So most breeds of dogs, their inherited cataracts tend to show up back here, just inside the posterior capsule. And they are usually kind of triangular in shape because the fibers are not long enough to go all the way around. So they meet in the front and the back of the lens in what's called the suture pattern. And in the front, the suture is a right side up Y, and in the back it's upside down. Because the suture line is where most of the metabolism is taking place, um, those, that, in that area is where usually cataracts form first. And so frequently a cataract is going to be in the back of the eye, usually around the posterior aspect of the sutures. Um, puppies are born basically with the nucleus. And then as they get older, the cortex is added on. Um, if you feed puppies a uh, milk replacer as on the only form of nutrition that they get is milk replacer, and it's only the very first week of life, there's a very good chance that the growing lens fibers get insulted by um, sort of there's no matter what the manufacturers do or people do, it's almost impossible to get the absolute correct mix of amino acids. So during that first week, the cells that make up the lens are insulted and they don't form normally. So very frequently, dogs that have been raised on on milk replacer like Espelac that first week of life will have a ring around the nucleus. But then as they get older and they either start nursing or they're on a more normal nutrition, um, then the cortex around them is normal and clear. So there are times when I'm doing a breed exam and if I see this little ring Sometimes I ask whether they, you know, they, the puppy was, was on milk replacer the first week of life. So, um, but it, it's just that um, it, I had a little bit of an argument with the higher ups um, in surf because I, if I knew that the dog was raised on milk replacer, then I write it down as something that's not inherited. But I guess because they don't know from, absolutely sure, it's, a, um, it's written up as a significance unknown. So those dogs can still be used for breeding. So, 
So let's look at some of these um, inherited cataracts. Okay. So this is a slip lamp picture of the trying to focus all the way in the back. And can you see it looks like feathering? You have this Y, kind of sideways Y, and the cataract formation on either side. Do you all see that? Mm -hmm. So that would be like a focal posterior suture line opacity. So this is um, a Siberian Husky um, with a cataract that's probably going to become mature very, very quickly. These areas right here are vacuoles, and these vacuoles are actually filled with fluid. And when these vacuoles kind of coalesce and break open, that's when a cataract forms. Um, and uh, Siberian Huskies can get cataracts when full-blown cataracts very, very rapidly, literally overnight. Um, and they're very, very inflammatory because a cataract, the proteins in a cataract are a little different than what the body is used to. So again, it sets up an inflammatory reaction. So dogs can react to the cataracts as if it's a foreign body and set up inflammation. So if you have a dog that develops cataracts, but the quality of life is not being affected, then there's really no reason to do surgery, but you do have to control any inflammation that the presence of the cataract causes. Is that red? Is that from a dye? Or is well, that... that's the reflection. Siberian oh. Huskies with, with blue eyes are subalbinotic. They don't have very much pigment okay. in the back, so their reflection is a little bit more like a person's with the red reflex. It's normal, it's this, normal eye, normal dog's eye. At what point would you expect, so since I've just been told recently that everybody gets cataracts at some point in their lives, some sooner or some later, That's well, not the true. longer you live, the more likely you have of getting it. That's not true. I mm -hmm. just at the eye doctor yesterday. That's not true. I don't care. <laughs> a, lot of a lot of times yeah. veterinarians and MDs will refer to lenticular sclerosis, which is the normal hardening of the lens, as a senile cataract. But by definition, it's not a cataract because it never becomes opaque. Mm -hmm. So, but for just ease of conversation, they refer to lenticular sclerosis as a senile cataract. But it's an, not I, a cataract. I had an ophthalmologist in California who described one of my dog's eye problems as virally induced cataracts. Does that make sense? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, he always was a bit of a wig out anyway. No, I mean, if you have if you have a severe inflammation in the eye, or if the if the retina is very inflamed, then it will cause the um, the the areas of the lens that are metabolically active to form a cataract. So it's possible if the dog was ill with some form of a virus. That was what he was making the point. Like parvovirus and distemper, they can, that can cause some cataract formations, but you know, I'm not going to get into all of that. But Do dogs I, get senior cataract? Uh, well, as, as what we, when I mentioned before that the lens gets it you know, has layer after layer, it gets compacted. So almost all dogs <coughs> over the age of seven, when you look at their eyes, they look a little hazy, mm -hmm. and yet they're not really having major problems running around. That's just the normal aging change. Um, if a dog develops diabetes, this is the type of very rapid onset cataract that diabetics can get too. They get these vacuoles in the periphery of the lens, which is called the equator, and then they coalesce and the cataract forms. So um, 
The good news for diabetic dogs is that there is um, a drug in um, clinical trials um, that, that's called Kinostat, that if applied to the dog's eyes, if the dog is, is um, diagnosed as diabetic and has, has not developed cataracts yet, then if it's applied to the eyes, there's about an 85% chance that it will not develop cataracts. There is also a supplement on the market um, called OcuGlow that <coughs> is sort of like a dog version of OcuVite, but it's formulated so that everything, the, all the antioxidants and things are the right doses for dogs. And um, a colleague in Great Britain put diabetic dogs on OcuGlow, and he found that the majority of them did not develop cataracts. Um, sometimes you have to take a little bit of what this guy says with a grain of salt, but um, if you should have a dog that develops cataracts, you have nothing to lose and possibly vision to gain by putting the dog on this OcuGlow. And it's available online. Yeah? Is it possible that if you supplement the dog with yellow or, you know, carotenoids and yellow foods that have the low TN and the other types of um, impacts and kind of things like that. Will that help prevent cataracts from getting the antioxidants for their food? I'm really not sure, um, but lutein is one of the most important um, things in the oculum. So, things with lutein, but I don't know whether feeding a dog carrots or is, is going to have enough lutein to make a difference. I really don't know. Okay, so um, again, this is a Siberian Husky slit lamp. The front of the um, lens is clear, but this is um, a focal opacity in the very back of the lens. Um, sometimes these stay the same throughout the dog's life and sometimes they stay the same for a number of years and then suddenly mature. And this is a dog with a mature cataract and you can see from the appearance of the white of the eye it's inflamed and that's because the eye is reacting to the cataract as if it's a foreign body. So, this dog doesn't necessarily need to have the lens removed, but he does need to be on anti-inflammatory medications. If they're not on anti-inflammatory medications, you can get adhesions forming or those little strands that hold the lens in place break down, the lens shifts out of position and they get secondary glaucoma. So it's easier to apply a drop every once in a while than it is to deal with glaucoma. And that brings us to glaucoma. So if I put a funny lens on a dog's eye that allowed the light to be sort of diffracted into the angle, this is what a normal angle looks like. So if this is the cornea and this is the iris, this is the drainage angle. And all these areas are open for fluid to flow out. A lot of dogs that develop glaucoma, and basset hounds are famous for this, um, instead of having a normal angle, they have the area that should have become the drainage angle doesn't form normally, and they have this solid band with occasional flow holes. Now, 95% of basset hounds have gonioidogenesis. They have angles that look like this. But 95% of basset hounds don't get glaucoma. So there's something else that happens that we're not 100% sure of, but um, usually when they do develop glaucoma, it's very, very inflammatory. So this is a picture of a dog with glaucoma. Things that happen when there's glaucoma are um, because the fluid can't get out the way it should, it's forced forward into the cornea and it causes this hazy appearance. Um, 
sometimes this hazy appearance is called steamy edema because it looks like a mirror when you come out of a really hot shower. And the vessels become very engorged and the dog is unable, the pupil is, stays dilated. Um, so this is what um, a dog with very early onset glaucoma looks like. This is a dog that has had it for a longer amount of time. So a lot of the changes in the cornea are permanent, the haziness. That area that looks like sideways glasses are from breaks in the inner part of the cornea that allow more fluid into those areas. So um, the medical term for those areas is what's called habstria, but they're just breaks in the inner, inner layer of the cornea. And um, this is a little cocker spaniel that had bilateral glaucoma. And there are a couple of treatments for end-stage glaucoma. One is total removal of the eye. Um, you can also inject medication into the eye that destroys the ciliary body. But that's not always, that doesn't always work. Or you can not take the eye out, but take the contents of the eye out and replace it with a silicone sphere. And that's what this little guy has. So, yeah, his eyes look a little funny, but that's because they're silicone. I had one from glaucoma. I went to bed one night, she was totally normal. Got up the next morning and the eye was huge. Mm -hmm. You know, straight into the bed. And she did lose, we treated the eye and it just wasn't doing anything. And we did remove the eye and about two years later the same thing happened with her other eye. Right. And we removed, removed the eye. But she did fine. Oh yeah. I mean, she Dogs, dogs that, um, the bad thing about glaucoma is it's incredibly painful. People yeah. with glaucoma mm -hmm. say that when the pressure goes up, it's like getting a migraine headache. Mm -hmm. Very headachey to the point of nausea. Um, so dogs act the same way. They'll maybe hide, not want to come out into the light, like leave me alone, I want to be in a dark place. Um, their appetite goes off, they might vomit. Um, there is something called a diurnal variation in the pressure, which means that if we check everybody's pressure in this room every hour around the clock, it normally goes up at night. So that's one of the reasons that it's it frequently you go to sleep and everything's fine and then in the middle of the night the dog might start whining and in the morning it's you know acting blind in that eye because the pressure does go up at night and that's why some of the medications that are used just once a day are used at night because they work the best at night. Well, Diane's point, I think, is, is that there was no gradual onset. This was that we saw. Oh, and the, the second eye went the same usually way. isn't gradual. Yeah. Um, and statistically, when you have a primary glaucoma, the second eye does go within two years. Yeah. Okay. So you weren't on prophylactic treatment for the second eye. No, we weren't. Yeah. And it was. We treated her for maybe four or five days, and it. It wasn't working. Yeah. So that's when we went in. But no, my point being is that she lost both eyes, but it didn't slow her down. No, it usually doesn't. You know, I mean, and no, I just, tell I tell people that they don't have to learn how to read Braille. No. They don't have to train for a new profession. They don't have to hire um, a, a chauffeur to try, you know, for them. So dogs usually, as long as they're not in pain, and that's the yeah. important thing. Um, as long as they're comfortable and in their own surroundings, they just get on with their lives. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times people will swear. There is one, one of my colleagues talks about a dog like this, that he did bilateral prostheses. And about a month later, the owner called and told him, the dog is doing great. You can see everything. Because <laughs> the dog had adapted so well that, and he could not, convinced the owner that it was, it was impossible for the dog to see. Um, so the dog in that picture is blind. Yeah. Um, you probably all know um, Seth Koch, if you haven't been to him at some point. He's semi-retired, but 
for years he used to refer to glaucoma as um, silicone deficiency. <laughs> so. so let's go back to the normal retina. Optic nerve, nice pink optic nerve in the center with all the vessels coming in and out of it. <coughs> Lower aspect, non-tapetum, upper aspect, tapetum. So this retina is dirty, um, but you can see that um, the tapetal area is what's called hyperreflective, and the vessels are much thinner than they were in the first picture. You see the difference? And in order to get this picture, you have to go down on the amount of light that you're using, and otherwise it would just totally bleach it out. So this is um, the retina of a dog with <coughs> aggressive retinal atrophy. Um, that, knock on wood, I hardly <coughs> ever see in the Samoyed, but they are, it is a, a problem that they can get. Samoyeds get the same type of PRA that um, Huskies get, and that's called X-linked. The gene is on the X chromosome. So you almost always see X-linked progressive retinal atrophy in a male dog because it's very unusual for a female to have two bad um, genes because she'd have both X, because females are XX and males are XY. So um, a male only needs one of the Xs to be affected. A female needs two bad genes. So it would have to be a really bad breeding for a female, but, and not that that doesn't happen, but um, for that to happen. You know, to, for Is that the situation where the puppies are born blind? Um, yeah. Yeah. Because, I, I mean, I remember seeing a case that was on our Facebook thing about they were looking for homes for two puppies born in San Francisco that were born blind because well, they haven't been no, tested. No, actually, they will, they'll will have vision, but they go blind very, very quickly before they're oh, a year of age. Okay. So this is a much more advanced progressive retinal atrophy. Um, you can see the optic nerve is now very small, pale, degenerated. You can hardly see any vessels. And again, hyperreflectivity of the of the tapetum and the, the retina becomes hyperreflective because as the retina degenerates it thins and so there's less retina over the tapetum so it gets shinier um, and because um, dogs normally see better at night dogs with earlier progressive retinal atrophy will have problems at night much much um, earlier than they have problems during the day. The other thing that people will see, especially with dogs that are doing agility, is dogs will see movement, but they don't see stationary things. So the dog might see a ball being thrown, but doesn't can't find the ball once it lands. So those are some of the early signs. And this is the non-tapetum of the dog with advanced um, PRA. And these are what's called ghost vessels. All those white areas are where vessels used to flow through. They used to have this bright red color. And now there's no vessel in them. But the path that the vessels took is still there. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about some other things that occur um, sporadically. Um, this is what's called dystochiasis, which is a fancy term for extra lashes. Um, it's when the lashes come through the lid margin, and instead of curling away from the eye, go towards the eye. And even these extra lashes can have a life cycle um, when they're when they're long, they don't cause a problem, but when they fall out and they start growing back in, they're short and stubby, and that's when they scratch the eye and can cause <coughs> ulcers. There are a number of breeds that typically have extra lashes um, on breed exams. I sometimes see them in Samoyeds, very common in Cocker Spaniels, like 90% of American Cocker Spaniels have them. 
um, very, very common in golden retrievers as well. Some of these breeds that have them commonly, they are soft and do not cause a problem, but they do cause a problem if they're plucked out, because then when they grow back, they're short and stubby, and that's when they scratch. Um, this is entropion, which is a rolling in of the lid. Usually it's the lower lid, and it happens um, in younger dogs. It mostly happens because the muscle um, around the eyelid that's responsible for blinking up near the lid margin, it's in a state of contraction, and it sucks that lid in. And there's two parts to the entropion. One is the true anatomy, and the other is what's called the spastic component. Because the dog experiences this comfort, they can suck it in even more, and it becomes a vicious cycle. Easy, very easy to take care of. Just make, take out a strip of skin that is not wide, but is deep enough to get that muscle so it doesn't constrict, um, can't contract, and it's uh, is cured. In older dogs, very frequently, the, which is what you're dealing with, um, the fat and behind the eye that kind of holds the eye forward in the orbit is absorbed from the body. Um, and so the eye sits further back in the orbit. And so there's nothing to hold the lids out anymore. So they sort of fall in. And that's, um, that sometimes can be a little bit trickier to repair because you repair it, but then if more degenerates and the eye falls back in, then it can reoccur. Um, if anybody knows of um, a dermatologist that uses some of the fillers, some of my colleagues will inject the lids with these fillers and just sort of puff them up and takes care of it without Botox. doing surgery. <laughs> Yeah, but no, no, I mean, uh, one of the, no, it's not Botox, yeah, like so yeah, no, it's, it's way too expensive, you know, for <laughs> anybody, but if you find, if you find a dermatologist that has a little bit of a leftover syringe, then. Um, this is a dog with persistent pupillary membranes. Um, they are very, very common. Most Persistent pupillary membranes go from one part of the iris to the other and are considered totally benign. So they arise not from the pupil margin, but this area right here, the collarette. During development of the eye, there is a membrane that covers the pupil, and this membrane degenerates prior to birth. And sometimes some of these, mem these little fibers are left behind, and in this case, they have been left behind and they are attached to each other and they're also attached to the inner surface of the cornea. So the area where they're attaching to the cornea has this opacity. Sometimes they go back to the lens and they attach to the lens. Um, sometimes you can have a little tag on the inner surface of the cornea but no strand or a little tag on the lens and no strands. So you can get all sorts of things. But the majority of PPMs that are seen um, just go from like this part of the collarette to this part, or they can cross over from here to here. But as long as the strand just goes from one part of the iris to the other, the, um, the animal can be used for breeding. Um, but if it they come forward and attach to the cornea or back and attach to the lens, then it's a no for breeding. Even in breeds that don't have a problem with PPMs. So, it's unfortunate. Okay. Um, another problem that is seen relatively commonly, um, and I see it in, in Sammy's, is a little bit of sub-epithelial corneal dystrophy. Um, it's usually just underneath the surface of the cornea. There's a little bit of a deposition of cholesterol. Most of the time, it has nothing to do with the cholesterol in the food or the bloodstream. It's just an inability of the corneal cells to metabolize the cholesterol. 
occasionally it can be because it can be because there was an ulcer and the cells were damaged. But I see it just as frequently as it's just got, you know areas of cholesterol deposited into the cornea, and there's no reason for it. It's uh, and it's perfectly acceptable for breeding. That's cool. It does affect their eyesight. I have cholesterol. It's usually cholesterol. Cholesterol deposits, is that the one? Yeah. yeah. And there's no reason not to breathe? Usually not, but I'll show you one but in surf. Surf, surf gives you a. Yeah. It's a breeder option, yes. usually. Yes. Yes. Yeah. It doesn't um, cause blindness or anything like that? Mm, no. Several years ago, I was 14 now. Um, I had a, a bitch with cholesterol. I'm pretty sure you told the cholesterol deposits, and you had mentioned not to feed lamb and rice food, which we had been feeding. Uh -huh. but there was a connection between. Yeah, the lamb and rice. Lamb lower. and rice food is, you know, very be much higher in cholesterol, and, and a lot of times dogs that get this happen on lamb and rice. Okay, so, I just wondered if you had changed your mind about that. No, that is this inherited? Um. It's probably inherited, but we don't know the inheritance. Mm -hmm. So this is a cholesterol dystrophy in a Siberian Husky that um, no matter how small or how large it is, when it looks like this, except for the scratches, it's a no for breathing. And this is the cholesterol right here. Um, it sort of becomes like a racetrack. It starts in the middle and spreads out, and it's like this ring. Um, it usually does not lead to vision loss, but it has been deemed a no for breeding. So, um, I'm not sure if any of you here have had dogs with dry eye, um, also known as keratoconjunctivitis seca. It's when the glands that produce tears are not producing a normal amount of tears. And so the, the um, several things happen. The glands that are producing oil and mucus start to overproduce. So they develop this discharge and then these um, bacteria that are normally all around the eye get into the discharge and set up housekeeping. The other thing is just the act of drinking a couple of hundred times a day rubs on the cornea and causes the cornea to thicken and pigment and get vessels. So this is a relatively early onset dry eye, and they can be as bad as this. Um, but even a dog, even a case as bad as this, um, can be turned around. Um, most of the time, it's just because the gland it has stopped functioning. Um, hypothyroidism can also be associated with um, with KCS, the dry eye. Um, so if your dog ever develops dry eye, make sure that the thyroid is checked. So just wanted to do one or two age-related changes. Um, just as a function of age, sometimes the innermost layer of the cornea um, degenerates and the innermost layer is responsible for keeping the cornea free of fluid. So if these cells degenerate, more fluid goes forward into the cornea then gets pumped out and it disrupts the arrangement of the corneal cells and dogs will get corneal edema like this. Um, this is relatively early. This is a more diffuse corneal edema. Um, the dogs can still see, but it's like looking through a frosted glass. Um, sometimes using um, what's called a hyperosmotic agent, which is like a salt and ointment form, the most common is Mira 128, can pull some of the fluid out from the surface, but most of the time there's no real cure for it. Does this cause eye loss like the black No, no. Another uh, normal aging change is iris atrophy. Sometimes it's just that the pupil becomes very irregular in shape because the muscle that makes up the pupil degenerates. And sometimes you can get to the point where the pupil does not constrict down 
And in that case, when a dog is in bright sunlight, a lot of times they kind of squint because it's the only way they can cut down on the amount of light getting in. In this case, it's the body of the iris itself that has degenerated, and sometimes these guys it can look like, like lace. This is another picture where you can't even tell which one is the real pupil. It's the one on the left, but you can see the irregular um, pupil margin. And on the right is just the degeneration. And this was Alice. I did my master's thesis on the visual acuity of the dog, and this was Alice in her frames, her testing frames. Did she raise her paw? Well, no, actually I was doing something that people refer to as hot dog evoke potentials. Um, I had a, a screen with a hole in it, and um, when the dog watched the screens, to so that we could get a reading of how well the retina was picking up. It was, it was like moving lines and squares and things like that. Um, the dog was rewarded with a hot dog that came out of the center. <laughs> so, uh, so everybody referred to my research as hot dog evoke potentials. But that is it, if anybody has questions. <coughs> vaccine was known to cause blue eye and um, intraocular inflammation and secondary glaucoma. And yeah. even the newer one um, can still cause it, but very rarely. Um, but I, I personally don't really know of vaccines. I have seen dogs that have reacted adversely to vaccines and developed dry eye, um, sometimes permanent, sometimes transient, or inflammation in the eye. But I think that it's very individual, and it's not until you give the dog the vaccine that you know that the dog is going to react to it, and then you just never use it again. But even if they don't react, I know that the, the guidelines said don't give it because, you know, not that this dog will react, has reacted, or that it caused it, but if you've got a dog with an autoimmune problem, you really want to drive up. Oh, if you have a dog that you know has an autoimmune problem, then you don't want to vac vaccinate. I thought you meant like puppies, because I've seen puppies that... No, my dog was diagnosed at age four, and so my, first, my vet was fine when I came in and said, I don't want to vaccinate anymore. Yeah. But other specialists that I went to basically were just wanted to dismiss that. They said, oh, it's not a problem, and I'm just curious. Oh, I think, I really think that if a dog has a known autoimmune problem, that, I mean, you can always do titers. Um, and make sure that the dog, and most dogs are protected for a really, really long time just from the... I wasn't pushing for it, it was more that I was going to push back against... Yeah, so no, I, I agree that if you know that the dog has an autoimmune problem and it's more likely to re react to a vaccine or the vaccine is <coughs> going to exacerbate, then like if you have a dog with lupus, there's no reason at all to vaccinate. Can you, uh, we have a lot of people here whose, their Sammies are just pets, you know what I mean? They're not mm -hmm. in a breeding right. program or anything like that. But could you give us some guidelines for, as a new owner of, let's say, a Sammy puppy, um, what kind of exams it should have and when, you know, through its life? You know what I mean? By regular vet, by somebody mm -hmm. by you or whatever. And, and then for those that are particularly interested in breeding, what tests they should have done and when? Um, well, I, I'm a firm believer that dogs, probably before they're a year of age, 
should get a baseline eye exam so we know that everything's normal from the get-go and then if there's a change, mm -hmm. we know that it's a change. Whether it's done at an eye clinic or, which I should probably talk about a little bit too, um, or at an ophthalmologist's office. Um, unfortunately, the majority of general practitioners do not dilate pupils and look at retinas and lenses, and so, and frequently when they do, they really don't know what they're looking at. So, um, I think it's a good idea to get a baseline so that you know if there's a change that it was normal at this point. You just touched on the issue of dog food mm -hmm. a little bit. Uh, question. Um, there are all these new designer dog foods out that, you know, high protein, raw, etc., etc. What is your view of what we should, the best thing that we could be feeding our dogs? Antelope. My, my, do my dogs are on and always have been on science diet. Um, I know that at Southpaw's, the doctors are, except for the holistic doctor, 100% against raw food diet. Um, because, you know, I treated a cat that was absolutely normal until the owner decided to switch it to a raw food diet and then it developed horrible uveitis because it picked up, you know, toxoplasmosis from the raw food. So, um, but I, you know, it's, a, I, other than that, I think it's a personal choice. You mentioned to her that lamb and rice is bad for, for cholesterol, but we're always told when our dogs have diarrhea or they're sick, give them rice, give them chicken, give them rice. Give oh, them yeah, well, I'm talking about rice. I'm not talking about rice. Because we put ours on rice because yeah, they're, yeah, bad. Yeah, yeah. they're I have two young dogs. And it's like, oh my gosh. And yet one, of my, one of my dogs is on lamb and rice, mostly because I, uh, I adopted, she's a three and a half year old springer that I adopted with epilepsy and I was told as part of her history that when they tried to get her <coughs> off lamb and rice, her seizures became more frequent. So I'm well, not trying to rock the boat, so I, I feed her lamb and rice. But rice isn't the cholesterol problem. No, it's the lamb. lamb. Okay, cool. But I just wanted to talk to you, if, you, if the people who do have handouts, if you go a couple of pages back, you'll see that the listing of uh, of how many semoids were examined and how many had. I think that the statistics stopped um, a, a good six years ago. And that's one of the, one of the reasons why <coughs> the College of Ophthalmology switched from having exams done by CERF from, to the OFA. Um, the certification process is the same, except that the forms are a lot easier. They don't have the little bubbles. Um, and OFA has all of the information from SURF, of every dog that was ever passed by SURF or not passed by SURF. Um, the OFA offers um, the ACBO. Um, we can go in. I can go into the computer and you know get statistics on any breed anytime I want. Um, and I'm not told by SURF that I have to pay a certain amount an hour for their, <coughs> their researcher. And um, they don't charge us for the forms. Um, and all of a sudden, SURF decided, oh, we're not going to charge you anymore right. either. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so um, there are a lot of reasons you know, why the switch was made. Um, most, some ophthalmologists still do SURF exams. I have surf forms when if I do a clinic and somebody you know says I want a surf form, I don't want OFA, I can still do a surf form. Most people I think are, are that way. But um, the benefits to us for having the database at OFA where the databases were for heart and thyroid and hips and elbows, mm -hmm. all of that information is in one place right now. And um, and uh, OFA also gives um, discounted registration fees. Like if you do a whole litter, they discount the fees for the litter as opposed to surf didn't. And for those of you who you know are kind of new to the breed, you can show us. Oftentimes at the different shows, there will be 
I call them surf clinics. Everybody yeah, still I uses know. the term surf, I know, I know. you know, but they'll do the clinics off the model, you know, like Dr. Yeah. Bromberg does them, and there's some yeah, others that I've will done do them. National couple of times. Yeah, and so, you know, it's easy to go. You just go in, pay, they put some drops yeah. in, and you do it, and you're out of there. 15, and if you're showing the dog, I mean, most of the time, you can still have the exam done right. even without dilation. It just takes a while longer because right. you have to keep turning the light on and off to let the pupil dilate. Commercial dogs too. Yeah, yeah, anybody can bring their dog. And in fact, um, I'll put notices out, and Carol does. Sometimes different clubs will put on a clinic, you know, and they'll have different tests available, and that's usually one of the ones that they'll do. So, you know, you'll see them all the time, particularly through the fall and spring. Is that you hurt them? Huh? Does that hurt their the, no, the no, no. It's just like you go over. Ah, oh, drops no. They just dilute your eyes. Oh. Oh. I just don't like it. Yeah. I don't like it either. No, but you don't fight them. I mean, I, I had a little tear in my head, I didn't even know, but it's all the way out in the periphery, and my ophthalmologist has to put this lens on it, sort of squish my eyes and then get out into the periphery. And I kept pulling back from him, and he had to get somebody to hold my hand. <laughs> but, you know, I didn't try to bite. <laughs> I, I guess apparently when I was about two years old, I did buy the I have a question, and that is, does a Sammy see differently than a sight hound, let's say? Um, sight hounds are probably um, a little bit more far-sighted. Um, I only got as far, the, the dogs that I used in my research were part of a colony at the University of Florida that have um, open angle glaucoma, which is the kind of glaucoma that people get most of the time. Um, and so my project was to get a baseline of what the acuity was and then, you know, have somebody, because it wasn't me, follow the dogs as their glaucoma progressed. Um, so basically, at least my findings were that, that um, beagles, because they depend so much more on their, their nose, mm -hmm. are a little bit on the nearsighted side. And um, you can te actually test um, the acuity of dogs. Um, it's with something called street retinoscopy. It's use a retinoscope, and but um, a lot of it has to do with the length of your arm. And <laughs> um, so you know, two different ophthalmologists <coughs> can do street retinoscopy on the same dog and get two different results, but they're usually not that far apart. But, but there are some slight differences that they will bring. Yes, definitely. Some of the too. Interesting. I have a Samoya that her eye, you know, Samoyas have the black eyeliner. Hers, which is pigment, is only half in on the bottoms, which you probably you know, would come in the rest of the way. Will that lead to, that's just cosmetic, nothing it's to do with her eyes? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, if she, cats that you know, have um, pink eyelid margins, if they sit in the windowsill and they're always in the sun, those dogs are predisposed to getting squamous cell carcinoma on their eyelids. Well, but, I mean, so if your dog has a non-pigmented eyelid, unless it sits in the sun and sunbathes all the time, <laughs> then I think um, She lives on their conditioning bed. Either that or, you, or, you, get, or you, get, um, you get doggles. You just get tinted doggles so that they can sit in the sun and not um, So that pigment like would so help her if she had it with the sun. We had to go to national where there was a lot of mold in our room and my dog developed the intermittent um, episodic KCS and it was one acute valve that required about six months of treatment um, with you know cyclosporin ointment. And I prophylactically was keeping on it now, the doctor said there's probably no reason to because the reduction is above normal. Mm -hmm. Is there any way that as, as an older dog he could be higher propensity to developing that again, or is that just related to that incident? It was probably related to that incident. Okay. Well, he's lucky, he's lucky it came back. Yeah. Uh, which yeah. reminds me that there's there's one drug that causes dry eye, um, and it, it's very hard to um, to reverse, and that's etogesic. It's um, it's a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, but most most people. Company at first refused to admit that it was having a Fort Dodge, um, and they had to give in and admit that it was causing a problem. <coughs> I got my Sammy that I lost in 2002 was on that for arthritis, 
yeah. analgesic. Yeah. And yeah, they were not admitting it because I said I had the dog with Casey, and gave, unfortunately, I'd given her some um, at some point. So not only were they not admitting that it was causing it, they weren't admitting that it actually did anything. It was a symptom of it, of it either. And so she it got was given a dog with Casey. Yeah. Yeah. 